event uh, which is part of our partnership with our friends at Clarion. Um, so one brief uh, clarification on the event. I think we may have told you that you're coming here for as part of the launch of the launch of a report uh, on sort of like regeneration. We're not actually launching the report today um, because it's an exciting, fast moving area. Uh, because Homes England have uh, changed the move the goalposts on it. Um, we've decided to reflect on that a little bit, and we've also decided to, to hold this event and uh, uh, reflect on the, and learn from the, the thoughts of our Harvard speakers, and then incorporate that into our research, and the, uh, the report concerned will be published a little later in the year, so we'll uh, you know, look out for that. Uh, but other, other than that, not much changes. Um, uh, you can hear from a range, you know, a range of speakers, and then uh, we will have a chance for some, uh, some Q&A and some, uh, some discussion. Uh, housekeeping things I have to do, um, and people are slightly bad, it's the first time we've held an event in this, in this building, but uh, yeah, I know there's no fire alarm planned, so if you do hear buzz and buzzers going off, then there is a fire and you make your way to the fire exit, which is that way. See, I know what I'm doing. Uh, it's, that, it's, that, it's that one. Um, the other bit of housekeeping is that camera there is currently live streaming this event to the SMF YouTube channel uh, because we're modern like that. Uh, and what that means is that when, uh, well first of all it means that we're we'll joined by the people online, so hello to them. Um, but for all of you, when we come to the question section, if you are taking part in the conversation, just bear in mind that uh, you're not just talking to people, friends, colleagues in the room, you're also talking to, uh, to YouTube and that the session goes online uh, permanently, so there is a there is a lasting record of the of the session. Just to, uh, to point that one out, and we will um, inform the benefit of the online, uh, the real time online viewers, um, and we will uh, very keen to take questions from them as well. So if they want to put questions in the uh, in the YouTube, oh, yeah, sorry, you can tell them all, I'm all of this new technology mm -hmm. stuff. But, uh, Rihanna, Rihanna tells me how to do it. Uh, if they want to put questions in the in the question section of the YouTube video, uh, then uh, my colleagues will keep an eye on those and try and get them to, you know, to me so that they can take part as well. Um, I think that is all the um, all the housekeeping in terms of uh, running order. Um, we'll I'll, I'll get I'll let everyone give give you their full their full styles and titles um, as we get to them. But we're going to hear from Brian, hear from Brian, Ham, Trent, and then George Young. Um, so um, uh, and then then we will definitely hear from Tom Cook here. John Copley is, I think, possibly closest. Um, uh, uh, I'm not sure about Deborah. We, Deborah is currently missing in action, so um, fingers crossed, Deborah will join us as well. But I think Tom, Tom, I'm pretty guaranteed, guaranteed will be here. Um, so that's that's my my rambling preamble over with. Uh, I will now hand it over to Brian Ham from Clarion for the the Clarion view of uh, the value of subtle housing regeneration. Um, Thank you, James. Thirty words of you with a hesitation, deviation, repetition. Oh, no, not that game. Um, I'm a practitioner when it comes to regeneration. I'm a project director for our major uh, Merton regeneration program, which I'll touch upon in a minute or two. Uh, we're delighted to have uh, worked with the Social Market Foundation on this uh, excellent and very thorough draft report. Um, a bit of context first about Clarion. Uh, we are the largest uh, housing association uh, in the UK. Uh, we're a big house builder. Uh, we've, we've built 10,000 new homes uh, over the last five years, 80% of which have been uh, affordable tenures. Uh, and in addition to those new homes, we invest very heavily in our existing stock. Uh, we've invested uh, over a million pounds a day uh, in repairs and maintenance in aging homes, uh, many of which are in desperate need of replacement. And they become regeneration projects when they really are beyond their useful life. And we work with communities living in those homes who tell us that they want replacement homes. They're crying out for regeneration. Um, in Merton, we're working with the council to the, deliver what is probably the largest regeneration program in the country. Uh, it will provide uh, 3,200 homes in total. Uh, we got a revised planning consent to one of the components two weeks ago, which increased the numbers. So 3,200 is how many homes we will be uh, providing. A thousand of those will be replacements. Uh, there'll be a net addition of about 250 new social homes. Um, and then an awful lot uh, of homes, either for affordable home ownership or for outright sale to create mixed tenure communities and to try and make the books balance as best we can. 
Regeneration isn't easy though. It's expensive, it's time consuming, and it takes a long time and a lot of effort to get communities on board uh, with the direction uh, of travel. Even in high value areas, such as South London, and one of our big schemes sits just behind South Wimbledon tube station, uh, even in high value areas and with big tenure diversification, it still costs us a lot of money, huge sums of money, and we have to fund that through debt. So the recent government announcements from Homes England was tremendously welcome, uh, telling us that regeneration grant uh, is now going to be uh, on the table. Alongside that, we are, of course, investing in new homes elsewhere in the country, new homes in Merton outside of our regeneration areas, and we're investing heavily in social housing decarbonisation. Uh, we were the biggest winners in the last social housing decarbonisation fund round, where we won uh, in excess of £40 million of grants, married with £60 million of our own money to create a £100 million programme to get homes up to a base level of EPC-C. Of course, we need to go a lot further on the net zero carbon challenge, and we're doing a lot of innovative and leading edge things to build new homes which are net zero carbon too. Neither this report nor the recent announcement, of course, will solve our housing problems. We are pulled in so many ways to make new investments, but it is, it has been a huge help that at least the new channel of funding into regeneration helps us to continue to repair and maintain, to continue to decarbonize, to continue to build new homes as well as to, to, regeneration, uh, to, to regenerate. So we look forward to contributions from the rest of the panel. I'm particularly interested in hearing your comments and your questions, and I'll hand over from there. Thank you very much. I would like to be delighted that we're going to join as well as the uh, yeah, as we get underway, we've got one, one more to come for a, a full house, so uh, hopefully Tom mm -hmm. Godley will, uh, will be with us as uh, as others speak. Uh, next, uh, next to is my colleague Shrenander, who's leading on that uh, uh, the SMS research that's under underway in this project. So, uh, Shrey will run you through your sneak a sneak preview of the uh, the provisional uh, finding and ideas that we're kicking around for, yeah, for this project. So, um, uh, we'll proceed. Um, great. Uh, hi everyone, I'm here to talk a little bit about our research into the value of social housing regeneration, so um, a bit about the context and what we mean by regeneration, why this is so important, what some of the current barriers to investment are, and finally, what the policy changes that we think are needed to make sure that this investment can take place. So firstly, what does the current landscape look like and what do we mean by regeneration? So standards in social housing are on average higher than in the private rented and the owner-occupied sector, um, but there are still around 400,000 social homes that fall short of the government's decent home standard, which looks at things like cold and damp, disrepair and other safety hazards. Um, and media reporting has highlighted cases of poor conditions, um, and the topic has gained further attention following the tragic death, death of a Wabashak in Rochdale from exposure to black mould in the social rental flat he lived in. So there's a clear need for further investment into addressing these instances, instances of poor conditions, as well as changes to the way that the sector is regulated. So what do we mean by regeneration? Um, in general, there are various types of social housing investment um, from the most narrow to the broadest. So things like maintenance and minor repairs, refurbishment and retrofitting, um, major works and repairs, such as replacing the roof of the building, full scale demolition and replacement, and then even broader sort of place making initiatives. Um, regeneration is typically used to refer to bigger projects um, such as demolition and rebuilding and wider place making. But here, um, what we've got in mind is things like um, all kinds of investment in the existing um, housing stock, so including refurbishment and retrofitting, as well as um, broader demolition and replacement projects. Now I'll talk a bit about why this investment is so important. Um, as part of our research, we looked at three kinds of impact from regeneration, so impacts on well-being, economic impacts, and environmental impacts. So I'll go through each of these in turn and summarise our key findings in these areas. So firstly, on well-being, um, the most important impact of investment in social housing regeneration is, of course, better living conditions for tenants. Um, this is linked to well-being. Those living in poor housing are more likely to suffer from poor physical health as well as poor mental health. Um, and our own research found that the presence of damp mold or condensation in a home has a significant, statistically significant relationship with well-being. Um, we found that the presence of these things in the home is associated with a decrease in life satisfaction 
equivalent to an annual income reduction of about £4,000. Um, and of course, regeneration projects can have costs to wellbeing as well as benefits. Um, projects can subject tenants to disruption, prolonged uncertainty and community breakup. So it's important to design projects in a way which take these impacts into account and seek to minimise them as much as possible. Secondly, we look to the economic impacts of investment in regeneration. So regeneration have, can have both direct benefits for an economy in terms of incomes and employment, as well as indirect benefits such as um, higher productivity from better health or lower energy bills. Um, so we carried out modelling to estimate the impact on jobs and output of investing in regeneration. Um, we looked at two scenarios, so bringing all social homes up to the decent home standards and bringing all social homes um, just below the energy performance C rating up to the C rating. Um, we found that um, the first of these would cost £2.3 billion pounds, and the second of these would cost £11 billion. Pounds. Um, and we found that if these investments were made, for every pound spent, they stimulate an extra 20 pence of economic output in the economy. Of course, this depends on how much slack there is in the economy. So when the economy is very tight and inflation is high, um, it may have less of a benefit. But when the economy is doing badly, this investment can be a really useful counter tool. Um, finally, we looked at environmental impacts. So investment um, in regeneration can improve the energy efficiency of the housing stock and so reduce carbon emissions. Um, we found that bringing all EPCD rated homes up to EPCC could lead to a reduction in emissions of 330,000 tonnes a year. For context, that's about 3% of total emissions from the social housing sector. So if this investment is so important, why hasn't it happened? We think there are a few reasons. Um, one has been the direction of government investment, which has until recently prioritised new construction over regeneration in order to tackle the housing crisis. So, for example, until the recent move to open up the Affordable Homes Programme to regeneration funding, around 87% of funding for social housing was available for new construction, while just 13% was available for regeneration. Um, the way that the sector is regulated has also not provided strong enough recourse for tenants when raising issues with poor living conditions. And the level of government investment has been an issue. So government investment in housing overall has fallen by 91% as a share of GDP since 1953. And more recently, um, investment in social housing specifically has been 36% lower on average than its peak in 2009-10. The social rent regime has also um, created pressure. So rents rose in real terms from 2009 to 2015, but then um, the government reduced them in real terms um, cutting bills for tenants, but also cutting revenue to providers. Um, the macroeconomic environment has created issues, so construction costs have risen faster than inflation, and rising interest rates have made, um, possibly make it harder to access private finance. Um, and broader policy demands on the sector, from the building safety crisis to net zero to meeting the need for new affordable homes, have created additional needs for funding. Um, finally, some of the experts we spoke to also argued that the um, internal culture of housing providers um, had led to some providers choosing to prioritise investment in new construction over investment in existing stock. There are others that we spoke to argued that um, providing new homes for those on the social housing waiting list was an important social goal alongside ensuring decent living conditions for those already in social housing. So I've discussed um, the context and some of the benefits of this investment as well as some of the barriers. So now I'll just talk briefly on what we think we need to do in terms of policy. So um, one important question is whether funding for new construction should be diverted towards funding in, um, for investment in the existing stock. This is an argument made by organisations including the National Housing Federation um, and the Leveling Up Housing and Communities Committee. And recently Homes England announced that they would make funding from the Affordable Homes Programme available for regeneration as well as for new construction. So is this the right thing to do? Um, of course, investment in new construction is incredibly important. We have a housing affordability crisis driven in large part by lack of supply and new construction housing also carries significant economic benefits. Um, but on the other hand, um, many of the people we spoke to for this research argued that um, social housing providers' first duty, um, legally and morally, was ensuring decent conditions for their existing tenants. And we agree with this. We think it's perverse for government to impose legal responsibilities on providers um, regarding conditions without ensuring that they have the financial means to do so. Um, and we think that providing adequate funding for regeneration products may also unlock the delivery of new units as part of projects that would otherwise have been unable to take place. So we welcome the move um, by the government to make funding available for regeneration as well as for new construction. We think this should be applied um, across the board and beyond the life of the current affordable homes programme. Um, 
as well as this, we'd also recommend a number of other changes. So um, we think that housing for funding for social and affordable housing should be made easier to access, allocated on the basis of need rather than by a bidding process, um, that more long-term certainty should be provided um, to people providing social housing. Um, we think that the government should set a target to bring all social homes up to the existing decent home standard over the next two years, which would cost an estimated £2.3 billion, pounds, um, and that funding um, for social housing should increase in general um, to enable providers to meet all of the different policy needs placed on them. Um, and we recommend that greater certainty should be provided over the social rents regime with any shortfalls being made up by government to allow providers to plan for the future. In light of this additional funding, we propose that providers should be required to set aside a portion of their rent revenue to fund future major works, including refurbishment and potentially demolition and replacement at the end of the life of a property. Um, we think it's important that this is implemented alongside the other increases in funding that we've called for to avoid diverting spending away from other important areas. And finally, we think um, it's right that the enforcement of tenants' rights to safe and adequate housing is strengthened, and we, rec we welcome the proposals in the social housing regulatory bill at the point in this direction. So overall, um, social homes are generally in good condition, but there are examples of poor conditions, and it's really important that these issues are addressed. There are key benefits to doing so, and we think that by following the measures that we've set out, this crisis can be solved and ensure that all residents are able to live in good and safe and secure homes. Thank you very much, Ray. Um, oh. <laughs> we can put a lot of time to answer it. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Warrior, uh, is uh, Lord Young, who has done pretty much every job in government worth doing, uh, including six years as housing minister once upon a time. Um, if you add the two together, yes, two, two spells, uh, about um, eight. and is a byword in, 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 in Westminster for integrity and decency and uh, conscientiousness, which is why I am delighted to announce he's actually currently playing truant um, and missing votes in the in the House of Lords to, uh, to be here with us this afternoon. I'm very, very grateful. Um, you were kind, James. Um, normally, it wouldn't matter if I wasn't there because. Uh, the government loses votes by a very substantial margin, but today, <laughs> today we've been losing them by three and five. Um, so, so this, there may this, be a conversation. This event, might, this event might change the law. <laughs> <laughs> might be a conversation. But anyway, it's good to be here. At, 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 I suppose it's a pre-launch yes. of the of the, the, the document, and this may be something like a, a relay race because as one speaker comes, yes. I may uh, mm -hmm. have to go. You know, I listened to Shreya's very long shopping list. Um, the thing that I'm bothered about, which I wasn't sure was on your list, is actually the local housing allowances, which, uh, as you know, have, have been frozen uh, while the rents are going up and up and up. More of an issue for the private rented sector than the, than the social um, sector, but if I, if I had one priority at the moment, it would be up to the TWP to up the NHS. Um, I want to speak very briefly and just follow up and make two points. One directly responds to the challenge that um, uh, put, which is how on earth do you strike the balance between new homes on the one hand and regeneration of the stock uh, on the other. Now, of course, all social housing should meet the decent homes standard, almost sort of by definition. If this is social housing, it should jolly well meet the um, standard. And we heard the cost of um, 2.3 billion of bringing it up. But Basically, it raises questions which housing ministers, local authorities, uh, social landlords have to answer, which is how do you balance the demands of the two, the, the new housing stock uh, against the regeneration? Um, yes, some social homes are below the decent home standards. But on the other hand, you've got people living in the private rented sector in far worse conditions. You've got people in bed and breakfast, you've got people in hostels, you've got people sofa surfing, and each time you move the dial uh, towards regeneration, it means those people wait a little bit longer. And that's the decision you um, have to take. And the recent announcement basically turns the dial a bit towards regeneration. As I understand it, the same amount of money is available for affordable homes, but just an additional claim has been uh, enabled to, uh, uh, for it to be um, uh, spent. Um, and whatever the total resources available under the Affordable Homes Programme, those running housing associations, local authorities and ministers have to take a decision. Now, 
when I was housing minister, I actually moved it a bit towards uh, the new homes. When uh, Nick Rainsford took over, he moved it back a bit. And Rachel McLean, I think, has moved it back a bit with her recent announcement that it should go towards modernization. But perhaps there is um, a third way, which I think Brian touched on, which is uh, using what Michael Gove calls gentle densification. Now, um, this won't be the answer when you've got individual properties that need bringing up to um, a decent homes standard. But I think it does apply where large scale regeneration is the uh, solution. And of course, projects become viable if, in addition to bringing homes up to standard, you create new homes. Mm -hmm. And if you diversify the tenure, as I think Brian mentioned, into shared ownership and low cost home ownership. So I think that that is a, a possible way forward, which reconciles the need to bring up, bring the existing stock up to standard, but at the same time, uh, where possible, adding to the stock. But the, the, the second point I want to make is a very short one, which is actually related to the first. The decent home standard is, is binary. You're either up to standard or you're not. And we heard from Shreya that there are 400,000 homes that are below the standard. And I think it would be easier to answer the first question if the decent home standard was more granular. Uh, in other words, if it's more like the EPCs, where there are various uh, grades. And if there were a number of categories, then it would be <clears throat> much easier to take the sorts of decisions we've been talking about, because you could really focus on the ones that were well short of the decent home standards while well, perhaps leaving those that just failed on one particular category uh, to wait a little bit um, uh, longer. So if, um, if um, Rachel McLean or anyone is, is listening, just have a look at the decent home standard and see whether it couldn't be what I call more, more, more granular. We'll, we'll check the YouTube log to see if you're on there at the moment. If she's not, we'll, go, we'll, we'll get a video. Okay. Promise. Rachel, just tune in there <laughs> <laughs> and see uh, what you can do about the DC. So, James, those are all the points that I wanted to make. And if I do disappear, it's because yes. Chief Whip would have asked why I missed the last vote. Chief, Chief Whip's missing votes, are you missing votes? So it's a rare occurrence of Westminster. Particularly as I once was a Chief Whip. Yes, indeed. <laughs> so, I, 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 I'm very, I'm very, very pleased with Thank you very much. Um, now, Deborah, who's, who's joined, I will not, if I was to give you, give you all Deborah's government and titles and achievements, I wouldn't be here after me. So, I won't do that. I'm just, you know, I will just say Deborah wants people. Makes, makes communities better, um, yeah, uh, and is here in particular your capacity as chair uh, chair of uh, your neighbour locomotive floor of in Thamesmead. Yes, that's right. Thank you very much for your joining us. Um, so uh, the floor is yours, Deborah. For uh, thoughts on regen on social housing regeneration. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, the elephant in the room is my accent, um, which is from Canada, so it's not American, and it was by default. Um, I was born here originally, um, and a mum of nine. And as you can see, I am now um, in a wheelchair. So I, um, I do not apologize to, um, to say that um, when you give residents opportunity to have a platform, to have a voice, they will take it. Yeah, they will take it. But if you don't give them the platform, then it's very difficult for you to come back year after year asking them questions and saying, oh, here's another survey, and we'd like to know what you'd like, what, what you'd like us to do. Um, we think this is a good idea, and oftentimes they will um, have already planned what they want to do, and then say, can you just tick the box and for us by saying, you agree with what we have on our list here. And I've lived that life where the, tick, the, the list is there, and you're expected to tick the box because you're a resident and it helps the organization to look good. I've been involved with housing and I've been involved with the NHS. And I hold both to account because what they promise to deliver in their policies, they've caught on paper. And we have the ability to challenge that because once it's on paper, I always share with people, do you have a copy of their policy? If there's a situation, do you have a copy of their policy towards that idea, project, whatever situation that you're asking about? So when it comes to regeneration and organizations asking us, is this a better, is this a better solution than knocking down um, properties where people have already been together, forming a community and saying, oh, 
sorry, we're going to displace you for, you know, a couple of years or whatever while we decide um, what kind of properties we're going to build here or whatever. Instead of giving people the opportunity to have where they live, where they've created a bond with their community, an opportunity to continue to grow and develop while things are being changed. So regeneration is important. It's very important. And if you give residents the platform to, um, to find out what they want to, what they would like, instead of just a list of what you expect them to agree to, and then come back with a review saying, you said we did, because oftentimes a lot of these reviews don't even come back to answer what the, the questions that um, were, were asked by the residents. So two years later, they asked you 20 different questions, you answered them, and you don't have the any solutions, for example, we had um, a project um, that they were going to create a playground just outside in an area within Thamesmead. They promised it would be delivered on a specific date. That date is crucial. You've given somebody, if you're in a relationship, somebody gives you a time or a date, it's now more specific. And now it's something that they can be accountable for because you've given them a date, right? So a date was given October to, uh, 2019. At the time when um, this was being prepared, letters were going out. So residents were being made aware that this was going to happen. Of course, people were excited, happy, finally a, uh, a place for children to have a place to, to play near um, where they live. 2019, October, November, December, we're now into 2021 and nothing had been done. As the local chair of um, the neighborhood, I then investigated only to find out that they had found out there was asbestos in the on the land that they were digging. Even if they didn't want to disclose that there was asbestos because maybe they thought there was going to be this mass scare and people would panic or whatever, they could have just said, due to circumstances beyond our control, we were not, we will not be able to deliver what we promised at a specific time. And that in itself would hold the residents with, with the ability to continue to trust the organizations. So when you're coming to residents and you um, are inquiring or want to know what they want, give them the option of the choices that they can give their voice on, whether it's survey, some people are not comfortable to do survey. You might have to go physically to where the groups are being held or where the functions are being held instead of them coming to you. So if you really want the answers, you might need to reach out to the residents physically. So um, I believe the important thing about um, the regeneration that I think I would like to really highlight is the fact that when um, you take money for properties to create a new build and residents are already living on a property that they're comfortable but need improvement, it makes them feel that you don't value them. You don't value me. You think that I'm not important enough, so you're going to create something else. So we need to make sure we let the residents feel valued by hearing their voice, whether they think that this is a good idea for you to knock down all their properties and then restart all over again, or whether or not they would like to stay there while you restructure around them. So give them the platform, let them have the voice to speak, listen to what they have to say, and then come back and give them feedback to what you are going to do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dovani. You're reminding me of that you know, general, a general critique of you know, a lot of work we do as a, as a think tank, given that Westminster is very, very often not very good, frankly, at listening to the people who are ultimately affected by the policy work that we do. And so very, very, very few. 
reading that to hear, bring that voice and perspective into this conversation. Um, I'm going to go for a final, um, our final, uh, final arriving speaker today, um, yeah, Tom Coffey. Thank you very much for joining us, Tom. Obviously, you're a busy day deputy mayoring, so <laughs> very, very grateful you've been here. Um, you're going to hopefully be fully, fully briefed on, 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 on the thing you, you didn't mess much, I said. Um, <laughs> but, um, but no, we can, you, can, you can have the final, the final word, or final word until we go to go, 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 go the question session on, uh, on, on regeneration. No, thank you for inviting me. Huge apologies for being late. It was a meeting that overran where time-sensitive decisions had to be taken, so it wasn't possible for me to slip out early. Um, and thank you for inviting me today. And I, I'm, I'm very glad I got to hear uh, part of the, the Lord Young's uh, uh, um, uh, words, and indeed Deborah's. And, and, I, and I just really uh, want to re-emphasize, in terms of estate regeneration, how important uh, the point Deborah made about trust is in, in all of that, that trust between the social landlord uh, and the residents, and that, and that trust does have to be earned. And the state regeneration does have, you know, a bit of a checkered history, uh, let's be honest, whether um, both in terms of perception and reality about how some schemes uh, in the past uh, turned out, in particular issues around uh, social housing being knocked down and not being replaced at the same level that it, that it, that it should have been. Um, so under Sadiq Khan, when Sadiq came in in 2016, um, one of the things that he introduced uh, after he was elected mayor uh, was a good practice guide to estate regeneration, which sets out how the social landlords that the GLA uh, funds should behave during estate regeneration and crucially introduced resident ballots. So as a condition of GLA funding, if any social landlord wants to get funding uh, for housing regeneration, for a regeneration scheme from the GLA, they have to have given residents a vote on a substantial landlord offer. He also used the levers through the planning system as well uh, in order to require that all the state regeneration schemes must at a minimum replace the existing level of social housing. The tenants should have the right to return. Not all tenants, of course, want to return. Some tenants take the opportunity perhaps to move elsewhere if that's what they want to do at that point in their lives, but they've got to have the right to return. And it sets a very strong expectation that there will actually be an uplift in social and affordable housing. Uh, and certainly what I see, because I see all of the big applications that come through to City Hall uh, for estate regeneration, we are seeing those uplifts. Even if it's a small uplift in terms of number of units, it's generally quite a substantial uplift in terms of habitable rooms and floor space, uh, because small, uh, older homes are being knocked down to make way or bigger, better quality properties that meet modern standards. Uh, but at the core of this is making sure that residents have that final uh, say. Um, I, I want to talk a bit about funding uh, as well, because it, it is really crucial, uh, not just for um, uh, estate regeneration, but, but more broadly. Um, we, to put it mildly, simply do not have the funding that we need for social and affordable housing in this country, whether it's to invest in existing stock uh, or new build. Um, we just came to the end of one of our affordable homes program, uh, which funded a number of estate regeneration schemes. Uh, it was 4.9 billion pounds between 2016 and 2023, uh, and we delivered, uh, we hit the targets that the government set, delivered more than 116,000 homes. But that 4.9 billion pounds, we need that each year, every year for the next five years, if we were actually to build affordable housing just in London at the scale which is required. Separate to that, uh, I think we do need uh, a separate pot of money for investment in, in existing stock. We've seen you know, a lot of high profile examples of, of some terrible conditions in, in social uh, uh, housing. You know, on, on the panel now with, uh, with, with, with Clarion Housing, that valued uh, delivery partner of the GLA, but, but Clarion, like all housing associations, has, uh, has had e examples of this. And we've got to have investment from the government going into uh, main maintenance of existing stock. The government quite rightly are talking about a new decent home standard. I think that's great, but it's no good saying, here's a new decent home standard. We're not gonna give you any money to actually put it in, into place. You've got to have that funding in the existing stock. And I also think we need funding for retrofit as well because that retrofit funding could make the difference in terms of the decisions councils and housing associations are making between do we knock this building down and build something else uh, or do we invest, can we take this money to exist in the, in the fabric of the existing buildings to make them modern uh, and to make them energy um, efficient. Uh, so it will cost a lot, but what I would say by way of conclusion is, you know, we talk a lot uh, about the cost of what we need to invest in our housing, but what's the cost of not investing? The cost of not investing is 
the huge cost it places on a health service when people are living and children are growing up in multi homes. It's the cost because kids can't, aren't performing as well at school uh, because they've got no quiet place to do their homework. It's the fact that people are spending all this money on rent in the private sector where they could be paying a lower rent in the social sector. Perhaps they could spend that, uh, that difference in their rent in their local economies uh, and things like that. We've got to look at the cost uh, of not investing as much as we look at the cost of investing. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, we've got about 15 minutes left. We'll, we'll, we won't go slightly over, we'll go slightly over three, but we'll, we started a little bit late for, you know, for three reasons. So uh, we'll go for 20 minutes of discussion and questions. So um, uh, I'll, start, I'll start by, and then, by the way, I should say, if you, if you see me looking at my phone, you know, George is he's going to see if he's got a vote coming up. I'm looking at my phone. It's in case the online uh, viewers are currently, or, or are currently sending me questions. It's not, it's not going to be rude, I promise. Um, so uh, Rio, over, over to all of you. Um, they, they, First questions or observations from, from anyone in the audience, or I'll, or I'll have to viciously abuse my, my progress as a chance to start asking, asking for my questions. Um, right, sounds at the moment. I, 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 I will um, ask questions to actually uh, everybody, except for Trey, I think, I think we get to touch on it a little. Um, I'm interested in um, thoughts from all of you, or expand a little bit on how we've talked, we've talked in the, the housing policy context, and a few of you have touched on. The other very big policy agenda out there that has a bearing here, which is decarbonisation and uh, and climate. Um, so, I'm just keen to get more thoughts from you on whether or not there is a is there is there a tension between you know, between the need between the decarbonisation agenda uh, and the housing agenda here, or can they can those two agendas be made to work uh, work together? Anyone want to volunteer? Volunteer for that one first. I, mean, um, I, I can talk yeah. about the specific experience of, uh, of Merton, where, uh, for example, I mean, the simple answer is if you if you're smart, they can be synergistic with each other. So, for example, what, what does that what does that look like in, in real so life? so uh, at our high path uh, site just behind South Wimbledon Tube Station, where we're going to be replacing uh, about uh, 650 homes with 2,200. Those 2,200 homes, when they are built out, will be net zero carbon because we're putting a district green energy system in uh, that will be entirely based on uh, electric heat pumps, SOC pumps. And that will feed the power that is needed for heating uh, and hot water throughout the whole of the state. So that transfers a huge amount of, well, currently it's powered by, uh, uh, by, by gas. So, so we're decarbonizing that, that, that is now, we couldn't do that were we not doing the comprehensive regeneration of that estate. Uh, because you wouldn't be able to do all of the uh, pipe work that's needed uh, both in the infrastructure but also in, in the houses uh, it would be very very difficult to retrofit all those houses uh, using that kind of technology so if you get it right then you've got a wonderful ability to to, to win both on both fronts thank you um george first and then tom got in front of very final thought don't know about the community voice here that's all right um, um decarbonization is actually being driven by a legal commitment that the government have made and that is now driving policy on a whole range of issues, like, for example, electric cars, in order to hit the 2050 target. And uh, it's driving energy policy, um, as, we, as we've all seen. And um, if you don't hit the target, the government's subject to judicial review. And so to some extent, the decarbonisation agenda is driven by a, a legal threat in the sense that some of the other objectives uh, may not be. Now, now the debate as to whether or not that's that's right. <clears throat> but I've certainly seen how, uh, as, as the levelling up bill goes through, the, the, the government's imperative to hit those targets and there are various milestones on the way is actually driving the agenda. And presumably it will all feed through into building regs and EPCs and, uh, and all that. I hope that Brown's right and that it's, it's compatible uh, and that the new um, forms of uh, building um, the concrete and all that that's being manufactured is, is carbon neutral as far and, and so you can hit the targets. But the, the, the only point I'd make is, is that there's a legal commitment to do one yeah. and there's not a legal commitment to do the other. Thank you. As a policy making practitioner, how are, you, how are you reconciling that legal legal and political imperative with, you know, with the, uh, the, housing, uh, the housing need? Yes, yeah, sure. So, so uh, uh, the, the mayor also has, has, has a net zero um, um, 
a political commitment and a commitment he's made to, to net zero. I mean, through our affordable homes program, uh, we enforce all sorts uh, of requirements now around sustainability, uh, so that you know to make sure that we're building the most sustainable, we're funding the most sustainable affordable housing uh, that we can. I think in terms of how the sort of net zero and and, and you you it, it interacts, I think it's you know, if you look at housing estates, you've got you know low housing estates, the fantastic. You know, estates you wouldn't want to knock down. Uh, there are some that were built very, very poorly, and I think you know, regardless of uh, whether or not there was funding for retrofit, you probably want to to, to look at uh, um, um, a comprehensive rebuild anyway, because they simply were not built very well. They've got all sorts of problems at the end of their useful lives, and frankly, residents don't like living there. And then there are some in between where I think there would be a sort of if there was a sort of dedicated retrofit funding uh, pot for councils and housing associations there'd be a conversation about what you wanted to do a discussion with residents you might want to retain some of the buildings uh, and knock down and, and, and rebuild others but it would open up different options and different pathways thank you um deborah of course the, the community view where where is there a hierarchy of priorities here for difficult hearings versus this is Green and uh, green and cheap to heat homes, or how, how do they, how do those two things interact? Um, I think um, the discussions that I've had from um, different people, I think what people are looking at is that um, being invited to use um, more electric cars, and but then they don't have areas where they can recharge those um, vehicles. And so it's almost like um, you're asking them to do something, but not giving them to cho the tools to do it. So it's, um, I think it's a lose-lose situation for res residents, at least in, in our area. Thank you very much. And I'd like to try if you want to, of course, re recap the, uh, the, the headline calculation we made around um, uh, the environmental benefits of uh, regeneration, which is, um, how much? Can you, three three percent of carbon. Three percent of, of emissions from the social rentals. Three, yeah, three year, year, year available from you from uh, year, year from going from EPCD to D to C. Um, okay, right. We've got the audience. The audience have lightened up. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, gentlemen, there. So tell us who you are before you. Yeah, Paul Watt Birkbeck. Um, several of the panel talked about the importance of residents residents in the gate. Obviously, that's to be Shreya touched on the costs of estate regeneration, particularly if it involves demolition and rebuild. One of the features of the demolition and rebuild schemes which have began in the last 20 years is their longevity. So if you take the Aylesbury, the Aylesbury estate began in 1998. It's not due to complete if then, 2035. We'll be down in North London, very, very similar time scales. West Head in North London, we're talking about. Began in 2002, not due to complete until 2029. Cobham Park began in 2001, not due to complete until 2030. So you tell you and originally when, res when these schemes were all put forward, these schemes were, residents were told that these schemes would last between 10 and 15 years. So they, they, they've doubled that. Many of them beyond that. The question arising so, so, Yeah, the question is, so the, the issue is that the costs that uh, Strange skirted over, the disruption that it that residents experience over this incredibly long time period. My question really to the panel is, and so the, the, just the slight comparative, if you look at the schemes which were done earlier on, so for example, the Central Step BSRB or the Hackney, uh, the Comprehensive Estates Initiative, those were done, those are largely publicly funded schemes. They were done in 10 years, the internet. So most of these later schemes involve large scale public uh, private finance to do the, the financial lift. The question I have then for the panel is, what do they think is an acceptable length of time that an estate regeneration should last for? That's a very good crisp question. Um, well, I'll take this before I go. Yes. But does, does anyone here remember housing action trusts? Yes, they're a disaster. <laughs> um, no. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, the average lifespan I think was about five years. Uh, the estates may have been smaller. But you say they were a disaster. But the residents voted to go away from the local authority into a housing action trust. And at the end, they had the option to go back to the local authority. The ones that I dealt with did not choose that option. They voted to stay with the body that did the housing action trust. 
Um, but there was, a, there was a finite amount of money available up front from the Treasury. It had a, a proposed lifespan, and it was about five years. I don't know why you say the disaster. Because the first ones that the Conservatives introduced, which were basically going to be imposed, and there was no ballot, there was those were the ones that were rejected no, there was, there was, round by tenants. I'm sorry, there was a ballot. Well, the ones that you reject, the residents rejected okay. these. Then there was no yeah. housing action trust. I can I yes. add that? Yeah. risk of disrupting a housing conversation. Um, um, you, you, uh, George, are you, are you, are you, are you better to talk about deserters? I'm, to, 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 to I'm sorry I left on no, this no, aggressive no, note. No, no, I'm, sure, I'm, sure, I'm sure we can, we can put you in touch. You can, you can continue the position, continue the terms. <laughs> and, uh, so with that, I was also, Bill George, thank you very much. Not at all. Well, I was so sorry. But to return to commentary duty, we're very grateful for his time. I'm going to go. Um, oh, uh, uh, I'm going to go next to uh, next to Deborah. Deborah, you, you have some sympathy for me. That's the fundamental point. That Absolutely. quicker, quicker is better. Longer is bad. Absolutely. Yes. End up. Good. We'll stop. Thank you. Right. But that's. Um, yeah, end of I'm going to go Brian, and then then, then, then Tom's the last word. Unless you have any thoughts on, on the methodology of how we how we figure that in the in research. But uh, Brian, do, 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 the duration and the duration thereof. And let me talk about what we're doing in the, as a concrete example. You, you should never be clearing the area and then taking 15 years to replace it. So all of our regeneration programs are planned very carefully so that we move residents once. So in terms of so regeneration, building work, demolition work will be taking place in that neighborhood around them. But as far as they are concerned in their home, they're not being moved out somewhere and then coming back 10 years later or being invited to come back 10 years later. The fundamental driving philosophy is they move once when their new home is, is, is built. Now that's hard, and it takes time because you've got to do it in multiple phases. You've got to create a little bit of wriggle room to make some space to do the new development. We're doing, we're doing a, a, a starting next month a regeneration project in, in Eastfields in, in, in Mitcham. Um, and the first development will only be 32 homes on a piece of green uh, uh, verge land on the edge of the estate. It creates that little bit of capacity to be able to move people to then do the demolition so it's, it's about that carefully crafted phasing, which is important. And it will take us 15 years to do the whole estate because we're doing it in bite-sized chunks as we go along. We don't want to clear everybody out, do it in five years, and then bring everybody back in again. So I'm not concerned so much about the length of time a programme takes. I think it's doing it in a way which is sensitive to local people's housing conditions and housing needs. Getting them out of the overcrowded accommodation they're in, because as, as Tom says, this is not so much always a case of more units, it's more have, have rooms, but do it carefully in a granular fashion that gives people a realistic time frame within which they can just get that new house at a time that doesn't lead to a lot of disruption for them. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I, I entirely agree with that. You know, I, the ideal way to do it just move once uh, rather than having to do multiple um, moves um, and the state regeneration schemes are by their very nature long and complex the crucial thing is that you know I talked about the ballot that we have to get that resident um, support the resident engagement it doesn't end with that uh, with that ballot it has to continue throughout the life of the program and, and you know I heard Deborah mentioned earlier there are going to sometimes be hiccups that mean that things can't Begin, begin or start when they are supposed to. And the important thing is that residents are kept involved and engaged and it's explained why um, these, these, these issues, uh, when they arise, as they do, because development, uh, particularly state regeneration, is complex. Just on the Aylesbury, I mean, you know, I've been around some of the new uh, homes built, built on the Aylesbury, which are fantastic. The old estate, I mean, just to give one example of why it was right from the very start built uh, uh, poorly, the pipes, the pipes are concreted into the concrete panel, so they can't be taken out and replaced unless you want to replace the entire panel. So what they do is when they have a leak, they have to put a smaller pipe into the larger pipe. Uh, and what this means is that when there's high demand for hot water, um, the water goes out. When does that usually happen? Christmas Day. So this, there is, the state regeneration can be you know, disruptive to um, residents, but I think losing your hot water every Christmas is extremely disruptive as well. Thank you. We've got time for one more question. In fact, we need to, to uh, Mel Melbourne Rodriguez, many things, including SMF trustee, and therefore, never my boss, so I have to take it. <laughs> so he will, have, he will have the last uh, yeah, the last question before we, uh, before we wrap up. Melbourne. Yeah, thank you. My question is focused on the source of funding. Apart from government, 
What about the pension funds? What about the local authority pension funds? Can't there be a more constructive dialogue between local government, the housing associations, and the pension funds um, in order to attract more capital into the sector? Um, is this, this for those of you who aren't keen pension fans, we are, we are uh, uh, yes, uh, this is a big week in pensions policy. The, uh, the Chancellor gave a big speech at the Mansion House earlier this week talking about uh, mobilising more capital from our, from our retirement funds into socially and economically useful things like housing. So that's the, the context. Um, I'm going to go to you, Tom. Is that um, Yeah, I, well, I would, I'm talking about this. I seem to feel, I feel like I'm having a lot of discussions about this at the moment. So it's a, a very good question for us to end on. It really is a sort of um, a nut that we like to, to crack. Um, the, the key thing is, where, can we align the private and public interest? That, that's the crucial thing. So that, that's where we've got to get to. There's absolutely something um, that we want to do. We, you know, we, we don't, and we, you know, pension funds is exactly right. We don't, we don't want sort of, um, you know, uh, very uh, short-termist, uh, make a quick buck uh, um, funds to, to, you know, to, to be working with them. We want pension funds, we want that patient capital. Can it be done at a level which uh, is more financially advantageous, say, than, you know, to a social landlord of borrowing? That's one of the crucial things. But this is happening. A lot of housing associations now have um, a sort of a private RP arm with, with institutional backing. The Homes England has an English Cities Fund, uh, which, of course, includes, I, th I think it's, is it Aviva, uh, I, I think, uh, or one, one, of the, one of the large investors. So it, it's been slow moving, but it's something that I want to see more of. I'm happy to talk about it because I, I have been involved in, in uh, organisations that have raised uh, ESG type finance for investments in affordable housing and and uh, in my previous role we were massively oversubscribed. Um, there's, a, there's a huge amount of interest, uh, again the previous project I worked on, a huge amount of interest from some of the funds to get involved in social housing retrofit and as we were short talking outside the, the biggest barrier isn't so much the financial modelling to make it work. It's two things. It's using a common language, because the language that we both use is so different. Uh, and then it's about a mutual trust on both sides. Uh, and it's a suspicion that you're not going to get treated like some of the uh, early wave PFI deals have been treated, mm -hmm. where there's a lot of sense in which the, the public sector was ripped off because it went into those deals in a slightly naive way. And there's a maturity on both sides now, I think. And there's a calibration around those dialogues on both sides. So the likes of Aviva and LNG and Nuveen and, and these big investment houses uh, in, in it for the long haul. There, there is a sense in which they, they want to get into this. I think actually the barriers more are on the housing association side at the moment because there isn't yet, I don't think, quite an appreciation of what it is that they are prepared to offer. So I think we, we have to just improve the arenas in which that dialogue can take place and find a mutual ground. Now, it's happening, it's growing, it's evolving, but I think it could have a bit of a stimulus and a bit of a kick. Over to you guys to start That's to true. lead that agenda. Sounds like our next project. Thank you, <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Um, there, uh, you, you, We'd yeah. love to be involved in the GLA side right, as well, this, by the way. Right, we're, all, we're, all, we're all signing up, great. This yeah. is, you know, come, come back in six months' time for the, uh, the launch of our next report on pension fund investment, social housing regeneration. Um, I do, sorry, I've got one more question you could never, but I want to quick check any brief thoughts from a community perspective we're talking about big institutional investors there's any money coming down into into communities uh because the people who own that money want to make a return but they want to do some good in the world how can they best listen to and take account of the voice of communities when they're doing that do you think i think education give them as much information and let people the choice to decide for themselves um Take that flash, but have the last, last, last question. Of yes, okay, thank you. Thank you for, for the time for this. So, um, in a framework of, let's say, this complex debate of seeing a uh, regeneration also as opposed to demolition and refurbishment, what would you see as the role, what, what is the role according to you of, uh, according to the panel, of good designers, for instance, also in terms of the arguments of the pipes of a building, for instance, being inside walls that could be built by a good engineer or Good design and architecture and you're, are you, are yeah. you're from where you're here from? I'm an architect and I'm working at UCL as a researcher. Mm -hmm. um, right. Um, if we have a really quick answer on, on, on the importance of good design and architecture. Um, yeah. um, we're, we're about to kick off on a, a new design study 
for an estate that uh, is falling down and needs this kind of major redevelopment, regeneration. Our starting point is to hire, or we're going through the procurement in the next couple of weeks, is to hire a group of architects who are prepared to work with the community and effectively co-design with the local community who currently live in that state. So that, that has to be, for me, the best way of starting. It doesn't always happen, but that's the ideal type. On, on that point of co-design and community, community involvement in, de in design and Abs um, absolutely and i think um the other thing um benchmarking um comparing what has worked if it's if it's not broken why fix it so um yeah comparison to what what is working out there and, and um, improving it Thank you. I'm going to cruelly skip over my colleague, Trey, yeah, Trey and her to her teams on after. So to give Tom a copy of the last word, reflecting, you're reflecting about the you used last year as well. So we don't have to <laughs> and then we will wrap up. So, good, uh, good design, it's got to be crucial. You want to be, you've got to be designing you know, high quality buildings that will last for you know, hundreds of years, uh, over 100 years, hundreds of years. Yeah, it's crucial that we have um, excellent design, uh, design guidance, and the GLA produces an awful lot. I think it really you know, high quality design guidance, which is um, written. Uh, by our planners, um, uh, and I, I think now you look at a lot of the social housing that's being built now, particularly council housing, really, really high quality. And there are firms now, uh, architecture firms I know that, that, that's almost more specialised now in, in council housing, specifically like Peter Barber and, and, and Kerry Kusevich Carson and uh, you know, organisations like that. Just to name two, there are many, many, you know, many, many uh, firms out there doing excellent work in, in the social sector. Um, but yeah, it's got to be at the core, uh, good high quality design. Thank you. Now, with that, I'm going to wrap up because we're actually six minutes over time. Which things, but we've had the we've had the, the planned hour. Um, so all, I, all I'm really going to do is uh, is finish with lots of thank yous. Um, in no particular order, I think I'm going to thank uh, I think people, the online audience, both the real time ones and the ones who are watching again on on, on Saturday night because it's not on TV. Thank you for joining, you for joining us. Peter Rich Um uh, Thank all of you for doing for joining us today. Um, we will be in touch um, about. Uh, Further outputs from this report. I thank my colleague Trey for her excellent presentation and all the work in the project. Thank our friend, our friend McLaren for making it possible. And I'd like to ask you all to thank our panel for uh, their thoughts and contributions today. Thank you. And do hang around. I think the coffee, there's still coffee left. Um, so you, you continue coffee.